Welcome. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, the second seminar for today. Uh, my name is Paul Lonthal, Division Chief Fire Marshal for the Santa Rosa Fire Department. Uh, again, thank you. And I'm joined for this presentation by Neil Bregman, our emergency manager. Uh, and also have uh, Deputy Chief Mike McCallum. My mistake for not getting him on this slide. He is on the last slide of the presentation. So I promise he does exist. Uh, and we have a slide for him to cover as well. So between the three of us, we've got operations, prevention, and emergency management all covered here and hopefully give you a lot of good information, but also more importantly, be able to help answer any questions you have towards the very end. So with that, you guys excited? Yeah. All right. <laughs> so we're gonna dive right in and I will uh, let Neil go for it. Hi everybody, can you hear me? Yes. All right, it's one of my skills, I'm very loud. Neil Bregman, Emergency Manager for the city, been here since 2014. Uh, if you can hold your questions to the end of the presentation, we have a lot of information and most times the next slide will answer the thing you're gonna ask, but we will stay here and give you plenty of time for questions even if we don't get to it, but let us run through this and we'll, we'll make sure we get to all of your information. So, when we have a wildfire, myself, my deputy in the back there, Brittany Miller, will be given a request or rather an order by the fire department and law to send out an evacuation warning or order. When we do that, we wanna make sure you get the message. The way we're gonna do that is this first slide here, know your alerts. By the way, over at our fire department uh, booth, there's copies of this. They're also available online if you'd like to print it out later after today. So I'm gonna go through this. The city uses all of these systems depending on the size of the incident and the fire, uh, but we will use them in combination because none of them are perfect and we wanna make sure that we reach you in as many ways as possible. So starting at the top here, the first system the city will use is called EAS or emergency alert. This is the one that breaks into television, has the banner across in the middle of Price is Right and does the test. I'm going back a few years. The, pre the test was always breaking in in the middle of the end of Price is Right, right? This is that one, that's on TV. We will use this one when an evacuation is large enough that we're gonna evacuate a full zone. We've done that in 2020. We did in fact activate this system. The thing to understand is when we broadcast this, it goes out to the entire Bay Area broadcast area. So from however far north Channel 2 and 7 go, all the way down to Gilroy or even further. So we're talking to a lot of people. We, of course, will do that. We just make sure our message is crafted to let the people who need to know know. But this is a very big blast. The next one down is wireless emergency alert. This is the one that everyone is familiar with as the Amber Alert. If your phone is on and not on stun, not on vibrate, and on an iPhone, make sure that little orange button is off. If your phone is not on silent mode, if you're in the geographic area that we need to evacuate, your phone, your smartphone, will receive a message and a tone anywhere from 90 to 360 characters telling you what you need to do. 90 to 360 characters is very short. To get all the information in there, we do a couple things. We use evacuation zones. I can't write out this street and that street. So the next slide is we're gonna talk about those and making sure you know your evacuation zones. But the key is, after you get that message, there are other informational tools on here where we do have more character limits that I'm gonna provide you with more information. The WIA is wake up, something's going on, get more info. The way WIA works is Brittany and I will draw a box on the computer of the area that needs to be evacuated. That message goes to the cell phone providers, to the cell phone towers, and that's where it gets a little tricky. Verizon and AT&T have different rules around what's near a tower, and depending on how technology works, you and I could be standing next to each other. I have an iPhone on AT&T, you have a Verizon Android. One phone will go off, the other one will not. We understand that. That's why we don't use just this technology. We is a great technology, it blasts a large area, but it is not perfect. In order to make sure we're getting the message to you in a timely fashion about the addresses you need, the next one on here in red is the important one, and this is your homework. Sign up for SoCo Alert. SoCo Alert is the city and county's emergency notification system. It is the only one that you will get a phone call on Phone call, email, and text, sign up for SoCo Alert. The difference between SoCo Alert and WIA 
is that we is based upon where the cell towers think your phone is. So Kohler, you're gonna register and specifically tell us addresses that you wanna know about. You're in San Francisco for the day. Where would you like to know about up here that might be somewhere that's being evacuated or in danger? It may be more than just your home. Grandkids house, kids house, doggy daycare, middle of the week, work. Register every single location that you would want to know about emergency information for on every phone. Home phone, cell phone, absolutely free. If you're not sure if you've registered, it doesn't hurt to go register again. We can, it will not hurt the system. If anything, I prefer you go double register and make sure that you're on there. That is a system that you will get a phone call, an email, and a text. It is the only one to do that and it is your homework. We also, a few years ago, gave out, moving back up here, about 20,000 NOAA weather radios. In an evacuation, those will tone out inside of your home. Uh, if you get one of those, they're about $20, $25 right now. We can help you program it. Very easy to do. Uh, I believe there's a few different booths out there where you might actually be able to get a radio for free today. Uh, once you have the radio, if you are hard of hearing, uh, the county actually has attachments for it that's a bed shaker and strobe lights. So if you get the radio, we could have that to help you. Here's the thing about the radio. It's activated by the National Weather Service. They will do both evacuations at our request but all other weather information within the county. So the radio sits silent, but if there's any flash flood, any evacuation, anywhere in Sonoma County, that radio hears it and will go off. It will not discriminate, oh, you're in South County, you don't wanna know about the evacuation in Cloverdale. So it's a great tool. I suggest you get one. It's redundant in that it doesn't require cell phone or power. It has a battery backup and relies on radio. So it's a great tool for all of you to have. But again, the disadvantage of it is that it's going to broadly sound off at times where maybe you don't want the message. But personally, I prefer to hear about every single thing that's happening in Sonoma County rather than having no information at all. Going down the list here, Paul has to no, say something. Before he does the oh. silo siren, I'm going to remind him that we can hear him really well. So just back away from oh, the okay. <laughs> He likes to make the noise. I make, I make the noise. I, I do it as a party trick as well. Uh, so going down though, back to, remember WIA is wake up, get more information. Neil, where do I get more information? Uh, other than registering for SoCo Alert, our local radio and television stations, the city's website, being signed up, here's your other homework, for Civic Ready. Civic Ready is a replacement to Nixel for the city. We still put out all the same information we used to on Nixel, we're just using a different system. I need you to go and register for that one. That one doesn't have a character limit. I can write you a novel on where the shelter is, where the temporary evacuation point is, everything else. But I need you to sign up for that so you know where to get the rest of your information from. And I will say, because I know we'll get questions on it, so we'll try to head off some of them. Civic Ready did replace Nixel for the city limits. We have had a lot of feedback where people are concerned that they're not getting their Nixel anymore. That's a good thing. The reason that you're not getting a text alert if you've signed up for Nixel doesn't mean the system isn't working. It means that we haven't had a need to push an emergency, a message out at that level. We have tested it a couple of times. We use the text feature most recently uh, for to advertise a, a prescribed fire that we were burning uh, on the west side of Santa Rosa, um, more as a test to make sure people are getting it. So if you think you're signed up for Civic Ready or aren't sure and you did not get that test, then you're, you're not signed up. We made a decision to switch away from uh, Nixel uh, based on our experiences with it. Santa Rosa pretty much put Nixel on the map. Uh, no one knew what it was until the 2017 fires. The issues that we had with it was that Everbridge that owns Nixel started increasing their rates and decreasing their level of service. So it almost became a little bit of a power pool. Um, we also found that the system was unreliable. When the civil unrest was taking place in downtown Santa Rosa, we activated the system and used it to advertise areas that we did not want people to go to, like when the protesters are going up onto Highway 101. Some of those messages didn't go out until 12 hours later. Their customer service wasn't great. Um, and we just had a couple other issues where we had rogue messages that were going out. We had a grass fire on Stony Point Road and Sonoma County Fire District members got their notification up in the Porter Creek area. So based on that, we looked at what options were out there to replace it. And we went with Civic Ready. Uh, it has proven so far to be much more reliable, much better customer service. Uh, the few times that we've used it, either for 
uh, an actual alert level text message or what we're typically using it for now is for more community level messaging, whether it's a press release from the fire department or the police department. Uh, but right now it's been working great. And Civic Ready also has a relationship with all the cell providers where we have unlimited texting. With, with Nixle, um, we had buckets where we had to be cautious of how many texts we send out, what level of the text do we want to send out, um, which was then making the community anxious because they want more information. With Civic Ready, we have unlimited texting. So if we have a reason to text, we're going to text. Bottom line, please sign up for Civic Ready. That is our secondary system for information. We will use the other systems first. Uh, and you can find that slide other places. We will talk to all of the local television and radio stations to make sure they have the information as well. So here, when we do use uh, the notification systems for the purposes of wildfire and or pretty much anything else, here are the three types of messages you might receive and what we want you to do with them. So there's evacuation order, evacuation warning, and shelter in place. Evacuation order means leave now. Oh, we forgot to do the high lows on the last slide. There. No, you really want to hear me? No, it's fine. Uh, every SRPD vehicle, all fire and police vehicles have high low tones. The phrase to remember is if you hear the high low, it's time to go. If they're in your neighborhood and you hear that tone, you can do the tone for me. If you hear that, if you hear the high low, it's time to go. That's the best part of my whole speech here. So evacuation order. It's time to go. This is not the time to start packing the bag, figuring things out. It's leave now. Evacuation warning, on the other hand, is get ready. The conditions could change, though. You may need to leave in two minutes, two hours, or never, but it's a get ready. Here's the thing. If you are a slower moving person, need more time, feel anxious when the warning comes, Leave when the warning comes. There is no reason that you have to wait for the order. The worst that happens is you took a trip into downtown Santa Rosa for an hour that you didn't need to take. If it eases your concern that you're on the road and you're moving because the warning came and there's a threat in your area, go. You do not have to stay and wait for the order. Uh, the other type is shelter in place. Uh, while we might have that for a wildfire, that is more likely to be something like a chemical spill, as my colleague calls it, the methyl ethyl bad stuff cloud kind of in the air, where we'll say, please shelter in place. Do not come out of your house. There could be an active shooter or something like that where we'll use that. The key with that one is do not call 911 asking when the shelter in place will be lifted. We will send an all clear message. Until the message comes, don't swamp 911 asking for that. Okay, so we talked about once you get the message, I need you to know, because I'm using those very short character limits, what I'm talking about. The city and county, rather than trying to describe what area needs to be evacuated by saying north of River Road, east of this one, has gone to a zone system. And so I need you to go, whether you live in the city or outside the city, and look up your zone, make sure you know it, and write it down and put it on your refrigerator. We, in fact, have magnets over at our booth where you can do that and write it down and put it on the magnet. So all the information we're providing today is available at ReadySR. I want you to go look up your evacuation zone. We have an evacuation lookup tool there. You can put your address in. Sonoma County has one as well on their website. So whether you live in this city, a different city, or unincorporated, you live in an evacuation zone and should know it. The county ones use usually a four number letter, so you're an EF46. The city uses actual common names of neighborhoods. That's a difference, but make sure you know, especially if you live in an EF28, what the heck that is, because that's what's gonna come across on your phone, and that is not the time to figure out if that's on your phone if you are in that evacuation zone. Know your evacuation zone ahead of time. So, another tool we have, is making sure you know your neighborhood travel routes or know your ways out of your neighborhood. So aside from knowing your evacuation zone, I want you to know the multiple ways out of your neighborhood. If I were to tell you right now to go to the grocery store, you probably immediately, from your house, you probably immediately know the way you're gonna go. What if that's blocked? What if now again I say you should evacuate and go to whatever your planned point of evacuation is at your friend's house? You probably again have a mental map. If that way is blocked, what is your next best route? Sometimes the fastest way 
that you think is not the fastest way to actually get there. It will get there quicker if you go in a different direction. In the, in the glass fire, everyone went down to Highway 12 from Oakmont. They all turned left and came on 12. From up north in Calistoga, they came to 12. Lots of traffic. If at Oakmont, if people had turned right, or in Calistoga, that kind of area, people got up and over, they were to safety in 10 or 15 minutes. Our policy is, unless we in the notification say, don't go in a particular direction, all travel routes are open and available. So go to that website, there's maps there that show you all the different ways out of your neighborhood, aside from the one you know. I want you to print that out and put it on your refrigerator too. The time to print this out is not when the fire is happening and you need to evacuate. Do it ahead of time. Know your ways out of your neighborhood. Know the alternate routes. So now, Neil, we've made you, you made me evacuate. Where the heck am I gonna go? I don't know. I do actually. First, I'd like you to make a plan. Obviously, the safest and best thing is if you have the ability to get out of this area to a family member or friend that's somewhere else and the roads are clear, get the heck out of here. It will help us. The less people we need to help and protect and get supplies to, the less burden you're putting on the people here who are still suffering. If you can get somewhere, great. If you don't have a plan, we have a plan for that. You're gonna come over to our temporary evacuation point on West 3rd. Anytime we issue an evacuation warning or order, we will immediately open this. What is it? It's a big parking lot, but we will have city staff there. It's a point of respite for you to take a deep breath we will also have services like the Red Cross and Salvation Army there. If you just need time to figure out your next steps, this is gonna be a safe place. We'll again have city staff to help you navigate if you need the services, or if you need to get on your way after that, we just know that this is on the west side out of the way, hopefully from any fire, right? This will be open, we will be there to greet you. If you need a shelter, we will figure that out as a next step as well. But this should be your first stop if you don't have a plan to get out of the area. You want to do this one? Okay. Evacuation checklist. So we, there's lots of good info out there. On our website, we have lots of information on building an evacuation checklist. So you need to do two things for evacuation. You need to have a go bag with you. I'm going to call it your 10 and 10. What are the 10 most important things you will need to rebuild your life and that you cannot replace? Have copies in that go bag. You're leaving, you don't know when you're coming back. I want you to plan for at least three days in a really fun shelter. So changes of clothes, what do you need? A battery charger, phone cord, prescription medication, all of those types of things that you are not coming back now, I want you to have extra of that in your bag to be able to grab and go. We're gonna try and feed you and get all the goodies we can at the shelter, but it might take a little time, so I'd like you to throw in at least a 24 hour supply of food and water, nothing special, but just think about the things you need in a bag. So on our evacuation checklist though, we have all sorts of stuff to prepare your family, prepare your pets. We have booths outside with animal services and halter project here. We need more information on preparing your pets. Um, we also have a lot of information and we're probably getting to it more with Paul on preparing the outside of your home and your neighborhood. And again, I just wanted to keep these last items in mind. Um, the medications, making sure if you have any medical equipment that you keep a copy of the instructions with you. If you need something that needs to be refrigerated, what is your backup plan for your insulin? You need to get a little cooler if you're coming to wherever, we will help you, but in the interim, how are you keeping things that might need to be refrigerated done like that? Please think about your pets and prepare for them as well and have extra stuff for power. And with that, I turn over to Paul Lowenthal for vegetation management. Thanks, Neil. So Neil provided a lot of good information on what to do in the event the emergencies happens, but we get a lot of questions about what are we doing to prevent the next wildfire here locally. Obviously, 2017 was something that we never want to go through. We don't want to see anybody else go through. Unfortunately, it seems like it's something that's becoming more and more frequent, but from it, we've learned a lot and we're doing things a lot differently now. We saw the benefits of a lot of the efforts that we're under that are undergoing take uh, into effect in the 2020 fires. Uh, you look at how many people were affected by the Tubbs fire and Nuns fire in the city limits, and then look at all the improvements that were made for alerting, uh, defensible space, home hardening, and then look what happened in the 2020 glass fire. You only hear about the fact that we had about 35 or so homes destroyed in the glass fire. 
commercial businesses out towards local, uh, Los Gilicos uh, and, a, and a triplex in, uh, in Oakmont. But what you don't hear about is that there were 1,152 properties in the city limits that were affected by fire and were in the footprint. Why were 1,152 properties in the fire? Because they were impacted, but only 35 or so were actually damaged or destroyed because the systems that we put into place, the efforts that people are taking are working. We're able to utilize the systems that Neil talked about, get people out of harm's way. We're able to use a lot of the equipment that Mike will talk about in a future, in an upcoming slide to get into these neighborhoods. And the, I'll say it, the coolest thing that I actually saw, if you're gonna call it cool in the fire, was actually being able to stand in Oakmont with myself and our fire chief, Scott Westrope, watch the wall of fire come into the community, watch the embers rain down and around the homes and watch the fire basically go out without us having to do anything because it ran out of fuel. People cleared their gutters. People had the zero to five feet of ignition free zone around homes. And they really didn't, we in many cases didn't have to do anything because the fire literally ran out of fuel and the embers had nothing to ignite. So that was a real test for us. Obviously we wanna to get to a point where we don't have any structures destroyed or damaged, but I'll take what we had to 2020 versus what we obviously unfortunately experienced in 2017. With that, um, there's two websites you've heard about now. There's the srcity.org slash wild uh, ready SR. And then the one that brought us here today is the wildfire ready. So we'll get to it on the next slide, but the, the brains behind what's put a lot of these uh, efforts into motion is our community wildfire protection plan. The CWPP, as we refer to it, was funded by a grant um, and it, it brought together a lot of recommendations that led to this webpage. This webpage is now kind of the hub and the home of a lot of the information that you'll learn about out here, or as new changes and things go into effect, you'll see it. So right now we cover our wildland urban interface, what it is our CWPP, the grant. I've had a lot of people asking about the grant. We've got a couple of federally funded grants right now that are underway. One is to uh, do fuel modifications on specific evacuation routes. And another one is to help with defensible space and home hardening. We obviously get lots of questions on red flag warnings and fire weather. What is, can be done to reduce wildfire risk? And then the big one that gets the most attention is the property owner's resource library. There's a lot of great links and information on that page. I've had a ton of people asking questions about wood chips and bark. We've got a wood chip and bark study on there. So it really has served as a, as a landing page for a lot of very useful information. Yes, it's Santa Rosa's website, but regardless of whether you live in the city or not, there's so much information that is shared by whether it's us, Sonoma County Fire District, Cal Fire. We try and share similar messages. Some of it's just tailored a little bit to, to, to us, but overall it's a great resource. Our weed abatement program that's currently under uh, underway right now, uh, the weed abatement program takes place during our more high risk fire uh, season here locally, uh, where we're inspecting all properties within our wildland urban interface and all the vacant lots across the entire city. When all said and done, our staff will conduct roughly 13,000 inspections, um, which is clearly a lot, but it's what we do. Um, and we've seen the benefits of the weed abatement program during the glass fire or whether it's a, a grass fire that we've had recently or in the last couple of years where burn three, five, eight acres um, and the weed abatement program kicks in, uh, hits a break or runs out of fuel. So it's been a very beneficial program. And then most recently is our pile burning. Uh, we never used to allow burning like you would typically see in the county and unincorporated areas until recently. So we have two types of burnings now that are we're promoting. One is we will now allow pile burning in the city limits, but on specific parcels. Typically they're gonna be on parcels over five acres in size and in our wildland urban interface. Uh, and they're designed to help promote fuel reduction in areas that are typically inaccessible and would be cost prohibitive for a lot of people to do the, the modification. So allowing them to burn in some of those specific cases helps make us all safer. The other thing that we're doing is actually doing um, prescribed fire uh, across our community now, which is something that we never used to do uh, historically in the city. We did our first one last year on Old Redwood Highway uh, next to the old Fountain Grove Inn. Uh, we did one uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, near Youth Community Park. And we plan to do additional burns between us and Cal Fire between essentially where the Fountain Grove Inn used to be and Mark West Springs Road. Uh, in some cases, we'll probably work with Sonoma County Fire District, but the goal is to treat that area to prevent future fires from spreading up the hill or spreading down the hill into the valley floor. 
We're unfortunately seeing a change in our ecology in Fountain Grove and in our hillside at Burn Scars, where some areas are actually, believe it or not, unfortunately worse today than they were in 2017. Areas that used to be beautiful oak grass woodlands have now been replaced with scotch broom, French broom, and a lot of other really invasive species, a lot of the dead and down fuel. So the burning is gonna become critical uh, where it's appropriate to keep our community safer. So the CWPP uh, is a five-year plan. Uh, we, are, we approved it literally two weeks before the glass fire hit the city of Santa Rosa. We presented it to council. The plan actually identified the greatest risk to city of Santa Rosa was the exact area that burned in the glass fire, uh, literally two weeks after we presented it. But it outlines nine objectives and 46 actionable items that cover everything from improving evacuation routes to structural hardening, uh, outreach education. Uh, we are presenting our updates on that plan every year to council, and we plan to put a new plan into effect at the five-year mark. So it truly is serving as a roadmap to make our community safer, and we're seeing the benefits of it actually pay off. So we've heard lots of questions. What is our WUI? So our WUI right now, just for kind of getting everybody caught up. So this is 101, this is 12. This is generally what we refer to as our Bennett Valley WUI, which is in between Summerfield Road and Annadale State Park. We have our Oakmont Wooey in between uh, Highway 12, and then this is Oakmont Drive. So it's in between essentially Oakmont Drive, Highway 12, and Annadel State Park. We have our Mountain Hawk, um, what we refer to kind of our Mountain Hawk Wooey, and then our Fountain Grove um, Montecito uh, Wooey, which this is Brush Creek Road. Um, the Flamingo is right here. Um, the WUI has been in, in effect in our city since uh, officially recorded and this current mapping since about 2008. Within our WUI are state CAL FIRE very high fire hazard severity zones. So the state CAL FIRE typically maps areas outside of the WUI, but they also map areas inside of our own WUI. So there's pieces of Fountain Grove and Oakmont that even though they're in the city limits of Santa Rosa, Cal Fire under their original maps from 2007 identifies areas of, that they consider high risk. A lot is changing right now. So for those of you that follow it, Cal Fire released their maps for the state responsibility where areas that used to be high risk around the city are now moderate risk or a lower risk. Typically up in the areas, believe it or not, that have burned already. Areas that are outside of the burn scar, so like this is Hall, this is, where am I at? Uh, Holland Heights over here, off of Bennett Valley Road. Cal Fire has actually increased the level of risk in that area. So we're likely going to have to change our WUI to catch up with what the state feels is more of a high risk. So in the coming years, you may actually see not just our WUIs that you previously saw here, but you may actually see some additional ones down on the south side of Santa Rosa, off Petaluma Hill Road and around the fairgrounds. We also expect to see the areas that were in the very high fire hazard severity zone by Cal Fire, which affects people's insurance. It affects a lot of things um, that were in Skyhawk and Fountain Grove probably come out of it and no longer be in the state's definition of a very high fire severity risk. Now, you're still going to have to comply with defensible space and a lot of things that you have to do. But on the flip side, there may be some benefits to your insurance, believe it or not. It's a very, can be very confusing, but we're committed to as this rolls out and as there's changes, we will be doing a lot of outreach and a lot of education uh, to our community. Ready? Sure. So we got Mike McCallum, uh, one of our deputy chiefs who cover some of the operational improvements uh, that are also helping make San Rosa a lot safer. And then after Mike, uh, we are here for your, your questions. Um, so as we've kind of been talking about throughout both, both of Neil and, and Paul's presentation, since 2017, we've made several improvements and enhancements to the way we respond to fires, both in Santa Rosa and, and around the state and fires that are impacting us, right? Fires that can burn into Santa Rosa and, and affect us. 
Um, so staffing, what are, what are we doing? So during red flag warnings, we, we now have much better communication with our partners at the weather service throughout the county. We have operational meetings every Monday morning where all of the county partners, city partners are all on one phone call. We discuss and talk about the potentials from the weather that could be coming in, different things that are going on. So we're able to kind of predict and plan and prepare for those potential events like we had in 2017, 2020. And we'll upstaff for those. So when we get a declared red flag warning, we will actually throughout the county increase our staffing and preparedness to be able to respond to wildfires. We'll prepare with what's called strike teams. So five engines and a leader, and they'll be strategically located throughout the county to be able to hopefully get on those small fires, keep them small and keep them from becoming those larger impacting fires, conflagrations that we've seen that then impact entire communities. So we prepare for that, we get ready and we have that staffing on rather than calling them in after the fact. Um, emergency recall of, of employees, we have now plans in place and we always really have, but it's much more of a robust system now. So when there is an incident that's happening, we have the ability to call all employees in. We all carry our cell phones all the time now, right? So employees are aware of the red flag warnings much earlier, are aware of the potential impacts of whatever weather or other fires around the, the county or state that are happening. They'll be, they'll, everybody's well informed now. There's, there's no more reason or excuse to not know what's going on. Um, just like we hope the entire community is informed, all of our employees are informed. And when there's that incident, they're ready and able to respond back to town immediately. Staff fire engines. All of our fire engines, all of our reserve equipment, the entire city is an, essentially an emergency worker. We will staff every piece of equipment just as we did in the Tubbs fire, the Glass fire, Kincaid fire. We'll have firefighters and every piece of equipment going out and, and doing everything they can do to lessen the impact of whatever emergency is coming in. <laughs> equipment. Um, so several improvements since 2017. We realized as a department we needed to improve our response to wildland fire in the WUI areas around and in the city of Santa Rosa. Like we said, many of these incidents have come from outside the city and impacted us. But what, what are we doing to keep our fires small in town? So since 2017, we've added a significant amount of equipment, specifically wildland equipment. We've bought two additional type three engines, which is a smaller fire engine than what you see normally driving through town, what we staff every day, our structural type engines. Is, is what we're normally on. Well, we've purchased two additional for a total of three type three engines. So we're able to cross staff and get on that equipment, get to the scene of a fire, provide better access, provide better tools, and provide better abilities for us to fight the wildland fires specifically versus those type one engines. Um, we've purchased two additional type six engines, which is even a smaller stature engine, basically like a utility type pickup truck with, with firefighting equipment. So we're able to get into the, the hard to access areas along the creeks and people's kind of the, the ranch lands or, or, or rural properties around town. We're able to get provide much better access. We have two more of those on order, which should be here by the end of the year. Um, personal protective equipment. So we've outfitted all of our firefighters with the with brand new equipment that is able to help them be able to uh, to work better in the environment of a wildland fire. It's, it's, it breathes better, it's cooler, they're able to work longer, harder hours, um, but still have the highest level of, of thermal protection to be able to fight the fire. Um, so there's state-of-the-art equipment. We've added new um, portable radios. Every firefighter in the city of Santa Rosa has their own assigned personal radio. So when we do that emergency recall, they can immediately turn on their portable radio and be informed and have that situational awareness to know exactly where they need to go, what's going on, and, and what the situation is that they're encountering. As far as I know, we're the only fire department in the state that assigns a, a personal radio to each firefighter. Um, improvement to fleet. So we actually already kind of talked about this um, with the improvements with the new type threes and type sixes, so those wildland engines. A UTV program. We just started in the last year, we were awarded a, a grant through Homeland Security and through the county to, to develop a, a UTV program. So it's a side-by-side, -side, an even smaller vehicle. So it's a utility vehicle. It has the ability to put a, a skid-mounted pump, so a pump that will actually slide into the, the pickup truck bed, so to speak, on this little small vehicle, and then it can access even the tighter places. So Areas we envision using that are, are many of the parks, such as Annadale. It's stationed in Oakmont at our Station 7, and the direction and policy is when there's an uh, incident in the park, 
the Oakmont crew, if, if appropriate to do so, will actually staff that vehicle and can be into the park now and have access to the, all areas of Annadale within minutes. So again, the, the whole goal is to try to keep those fires small, put the fire out, keep to less than one acre if possible, and stop those large inc incidents from happening. Um, command vehicles, we're in the process of, of purchasing all new command vehicles for our line battalions. The goal is to have um, pickup truck style command vehicles. Now a lot of us drive SUV utility type vehicles. And the reason for pickup trucks is again, just to enhance that ability to respond kind of into the wildland areas, get that access, provide additional tools and equipment to the crews that are working, just all around enhance our ability to respond to those fires and get there and keep them small. So overall, since 2017, we've made a lot of great improvements operationally. We're just trying to improve our ability to respond to these fires. Again, keep them as small as we can and, and hopefully not have those fires impact the community like we, we've had over the last several years. Cool. Now, hopefully we got through a lot of information in a really short period of time. And before we get to questions, uh, one thing I do want to clarify um, is the I talked about the two grants uh, that we had that are funding the evacuation route and the home hardening. A third grant that we have actually came through HCD, so Housing and Community Development, through the state's program. It actually provided us with an additional half million dollars, and part of that money is for education outreach. So this event um, is based on, is, is in part because of, of that grant. So we're really doing everything we can to seek funding, to put programs on, and to improve our, our community's overall preparedness uh, and resiliency here locally.